video, I'd like to provide students in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy with an introduction to the third lesson <clears throat> in biology. In our first two lessons, we've covered really some introductory content, <clears throat> learning about uh, science itself, about the divisions of natural sciences, about the scientific method in a simplified form, and I've pointed out a number of the problems with modern science, bad habits that scientists have of constantly sliding from scientific discussions and inquiries into religious even and philosophical um, language. Uh, and in this third lesson, we're going to move into the actual study of botany, the study of plant life. Uh, this third chapter is titled Protoplasm and the cell. We're going to continue to study, to learn what biology teaches, to master what biology teaches, but we're going to be careful that we don't blindly assent to this teaching, uh, especially calling it scientific knowledge when there's no such scientific knowledge being developed in our own minds or souls, but we're simply receiving information on the grounds of faith. For scientific knowledge, we would have to observe and know these things by our own experimentation. Uh, and so the knowledge that we're gaining through, through reading a book like this is not scientific knowledge, but it's a kind of, of, uh, of uh, faith in the teaching of biology. And so we want to prove ourselves able to master the content of what biology teaches us, but we want to go through this content critically and make sure we remain conscious of the fact that this is not scientific knowledge to us. This is simply the knowledge of what is taught in modern biology. Okay? We want to prove ourselves capable of mastering what biology teaches, but careful to not pretend that this to us is actually a scientific knowledge that's been proven by observation. All right, so let's read this chapter together uh, on protoplasm and the cell. If we walk out on any afternoon in the fall of the year, we notice many forms of plant life that fill the waste places along the waysides and make their way into the cultivated gardens and fields, driving out the rightful or desired inhabitants. We call these plants weeds. Weeds are simply plants that we don't want in our lawn or in our garden. Let's study some common weed, such as the yellow-blossomed butter and eggs, which is the name of one kind of weed, or that ubiquitous, ubiquitous means present everywhere, the ubiquitous shepherd's purse, another weed that's everywhere. Let's study them with the intention of finding out how such plants are so well fitted to live. It's strange to think that some plants require very careful cultivation we need to water them, we need to protect them from the heat, we need to protect them from the wind, we need to protect them from insects, we need to fertilize them, we need to cultivate and weed the soil, on and on and on. So much care is needed for certain plants, and then other plants, we can kick them, walk on them, try to kill them, and they just continue to grow and live. Why is it that some plants are so well fitted to live? even when they're not cultivated. If we think of the plant as a mass of living matter, a mass of living matter, if we think of a plant as a mass of living matter, we at once are struck, struck with the evident fact that the living material of the plant has taken on very different forms in different parts of the plant. The root below the surface of the ground differs considerably in form from the stem. 
which in turn differs from the leaves. Still more prominent are the structures that we call flowers and fruits. Each of these structures differs from each other part, and each has a different work or function to perform for the plant. So not only are there different parts of plants, but they have different forms and they have different functions. Different forms and different functions. For example, the root holds the plant firmly in the ground and takes in water. So the root serves two different functions. It works like an anchor to hold the plant in the ground and prevent it from being blown or washed away. And it also takes, the roots also take in water. Not only that, but the roots grow to seek out water. So not only do they take in water, but they, they seek out water underground. The stem of the plant holds the leaves up to the light or to the sun. The leaves, under certain conditions, produce or manufacture food for the plant. The flowers form the fruits. The fruits hold the seeds, and the seeds reproduce young plants of the same kind. So not only does each part of the plant have a different form, but if we study these plants and study these parts, we'll see that these different parts also serve different functions. So we'll see, as we consider the parts of a plant, we'll study both form and function. Now, as we look at the different kinds, at the different parts of the plant, we'll notice that the parts are of different kinds. There's, di there's different kinds of parts of these plants. The first, the first kind of part is an organ. Each part of a plant or animal that has a separate work or function is called an organ. So an organ is a part of a plant or an animal that has a certain function, a part that has a certain function. Like the part of a car. If you take the engine of a car apart and look at the different parts, the different parts serve different functions. The same is true with the organs of a plant. Most plants and animals are composed of organs. Hence, any living thing, even the simplest living cell, has come to be called an organism. If we look rather carefully, from all sides at the organ called the leaf. So if we look at a leaf, study a leaf, we find that the materials of which the leaf is composed do not appear to be everywhere the same. The leaf is much thinner and more delicate in some parts than in others. Holding the flat expanded blade of the leaf to the branch is a little stalk called the petiole, which extends into the blade of the leaf as a series of little veins, which evidently form a framework for the flat blade, somewhat as the sticks of a kite hold and support the paper or plastic in place. In the same manner, the veins if cut crosswise and mounted on a glass slide under the compound microscope, they show that they are made up of building material which, although microscopic in size, yet differs considerably from the other material in the same part of the vein. The smallest units of building material of the plant or animal disclosed by the compound microscope are called cells. The organs of a plant or animal are built of these tiny structure called cells. So it's important to learn the definition so far of organs and of cells. Organs are a part of a plant or animal that perform a certain function, a 
A cell is the smallest unit of building material of a plant or animal. That's a cell. I'd like to say a little bit quickly about microscopes, just in case you've never had uh, the opportunity to use a microscope. They're really pretty simple, and uh, you don't need to use one to understand how they work and what they do. <clears throat> the way a, a microscope is designed is it's simply a tool that we used to allow ourselves to see with much greater power or magnification than we have with the naked eye or the eye alone. The way that a microscope works is that it shines light through something into a lens which magnifies the object and allows us to see details of an object that we wouldn't be able to see with our eyes alone. At the bottom of a microscope is a light which shines up. Then there's a, a base or a platform on the microscope and it's got a hole in the middle of it and the light from that light shines up through that hole. So it's dark around the hole but the light shines through the opening in that, in that plate. Um, we use a piece of glass or, or clear plastic that's called a slide and we place the piece of glass or plastic over that hole where the light shines through. Then on that slide, on that glass slide, we usually place a drop of water or some other substance, some other liquid. And then we set whatever we'd like to look at in that substance to hold it in place. Sometimes a little cover is put over, um, over the object. And the liquid, by the, by the adhesion or the stickiness of the liquid, it holds the object on the slide and the cover in place. And so the light shines up through that clear glass slide, through the object we're looking at, and then into a lens which magnifies the object and allows us to see it much more, um, at a, at a, in a much greater size and in much greater detail than we could ever see with our naked eye. And that's really all that a microscope does. It's just a, if you've ever used a magnifying glass, it's just a very, very powerful magnifying glass. Um, it sounds like a magnifying, the microscope would be, would be awesome to use, but really when you use a microscope, um, it's usually a letdown because there's not as much to see as you might expect. All right, but anyway, that's how a microscope works. It's simply a, a very powerful magnifying glass. Okay. By using the magnifying glass, of the, by using the microscope, we're able to multiply the power of our vision so that we can see that inside of a leaf or a piece of skin or the paper of an onion or any living thing through which light can pass, we're able to see that the substances appear, the living substances appear to be made up of small bodies called cells, all right? And those cells are believed to be the building blocks of living material. So now, later in the chapter, we're going to study and, and see what we can learn about cells themselves. But first, we've learned about organs. Just to keep to our reading, we've learned about organs, parts of a, a plant or animal that perform some function. We've learned about cells, the smallest units or building blocks of of living things. And now we're going to study tissues. What are tissues? The cells which form certain parts of the veins, the blade, or other portions of the plant are often found in groups or collections, so groups of cells. The cells of which are alike in size and shape, that is, in different parts of the plant where there appear to be different materials um, in the plant, we'll find that there are different cells collected together in those different places. And in those different places, the cells collected are alike. They're similar to one another. When we find a collection of cells like that, that's what's referred to as a tissue. A tissue is a collection of cells that are similar to each other, of the same kind, or of the same material. All right? A tissue is sort of the material of a plant, of a part of a plant or an animal. Examples of tissues are the cells covering the outside of the human body, 
the cells which allow of movement, the so-called muscles. The material that forms the framework to which the muscles are attached, the bony tissues, and many others. So there are many different kinds of tissues. <clears throat> so we've learned of organs and tissues, and now we're going to study cells. A cell may be defined as the smallest bit of living matter that can live alone. The smallest bit of living matter that can live alone is a cell. All plant and animal cells appear to be alike in the fact that every living cell possesses a structure known as the nucleus. Every cell possesses a nucleus which is found within the body of the cell. Now we'll see that different kinds of cells have different parts and they differ from one another, but the one thing that seems to be peculiar to the cell is that every cell contains a nucleus. The nucleus, we'll continue reading here, is composed of living matter like the rest of the cell, although it seems to differ in some chemical way from the part of the cell surrounding it. And it explains that this can be, th this, is, this is thought because um, if we put a, a dye or a stain in the substance, the nucleus will absorb that dye in a way that differs from how the rest of the cell absorbs that dye. Certain bodies in the nucleus take up the stain or the color of the dye more readily than the rest of the living matter of the cell, and they are called chromosomes. Chromosomes. So those bodies within the nucleus that absorb the color of the dye or the stain are called chromosomes because that word simply means color-bearing bodies. Chromo in Greek just means color, and som, the som at the end of the word is derived from the Greek that simply means body. So they're colored bodies. The living matter of which all cells are formed, the living matter of which all cells are formed is known as protoplasm. Again, the Greek simply means first, proto, first, plasm. The bulk of the nucleus is filled with a fluid. In some nuclei, nuclei is the plural form of nucleus, in some nuclei a body known as a nucleolus is found. It does not seem to be a constant structure. The protoplasm surrounding the nucleus in the cell, the protoplasm is just the simple living matter of which all uh, cells are formed, protoplasm. But there is a kind of protoplasm the protoplasm surrounding the nucleus is called cytoplasm, cytoplasm, because it makes up the body of the cell. So know the difference between protoplasm and cytoplasm, which is a kind of protoplasm. The nucleus plays a very, impart, a very important part in the life of a cell. Cells grow to a certain size and then they split into two new cells. So cells grow and divide. In this process, which is of very great importance to the growth of plants and animals, the nucleus divides first. The chromosomes also divide, each splitting lengthwise so that an equal number go to each of the two cells formed from the old cell. So every cell divides, the nucleus actually divides, and the cells divide about the nucleus into two new cells. The cytoplasm also separates and two new cells are formed. This process, the, sep the dividing of cells, is known as fission. Fission. So fission is the division of cells. It is the usual method of growth found in the tissues of plants and animals. Okay, so now we've learned about organs, uh, we've learned about 
the parts of plants and animals that serve some function, organs. We've learned about tissues, the different materials of plants and animals that are formed from the collection of different kinds of cells. We've learned about the nucleus in a cell and what a cell is in general. We've learned about the cell, the nucleus. We've learned about chromosomes inside the nucleus. We've learned about protoplasm and cytoplasm. And now we've learned about fission, how cells divide and multiply. The nucleus divides, the cytoplasm itself divides, and the cells divide as holes into two new cells. And this is how uh, the tissues of plants and animals grow by fission, the division of cells. All right, there's some fine print in the text, which we'll read through just for the sake of completeness. The protoplasm in some cells collects into little bodies called plastids. In plant cells, the plastids are frequently colored green. This green coloring, uh, this green coloring matter, which is found only in plant cells, the green of the plant cells, <clears throat> is called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, the green colored material in plants is called chlorophyll. And the green plastids are called chlorophyll bodies. So chlorophyll is the green coloring matter found in plant cells, chlorophyll. So what makes a plant green? Chlorophyll. The cytoplasm of a cell contains spaces which are usually filled with a fluid known as cell sap. These spaces in the cytoplasm are giving the name of vacuoles, vacuoles, spaces in the cytoplasm, vacuoles. Frequently, non-living materials are found within the cytoplasm of a cell. The cell is surrounded by a delicate living structure called the cell membrane. The cell membrane is, is the wall of the cell, but it's a living structure, all right? The cell membrane, the wall of the cell. This is so thin that it is impossible to get a microscope of power enough to throw any light on its structure. Outside the membrane, a wall is formed by the activity of the protoplasm of the cell. The cell wall is usually much heavier and more conspicuous in the cells of plants. In the cells of the pith, it was the wall of cellulose or wood that you saw under the microscope in, in a, a previous experiment in the book. Okay, so here we learn about um, chlorophyll and plastids, the cell membrane and cell wall. <clears throat> now we're going to learn a little bit more about the structure of protoplasm. Protoplasm, when viewed under high magnification of a compound microscope, is grayish, almost a fluid mass, seemingly devoid of any structure, protoplasm. A careful observer will, however, find that the material seems to be made of a ground mass of fluid with innumerable granules of various size and form floating in the fluid portion. Other observers believe that protoplasm consists of a fluid groundwork with innumerable tiny threads scattered through it, each thread being more or less firmly united with other threads of the mass. Still other scientists hold that protoplasm has essentially the structure of an emulsion or froth or foam. To them, the fine structure resolves itself into a collection of very minute bubbles. Doubtless, all of the observers are right in part, for protoplasm doubtless assumes all of the above-mentioned forms in different plants and animals and under different conditions. But we must also bear in mind that when we make observations on protoplasm, it may be already dead when we examine it. That is, it may be dead when we look at it under the microscope, and therefore undoubtedly greatly changed in structure. Or we may view it under conditions 
which are far from the normal conditions under which it usually exists as living matter. And finally, the instrument we call the microscope, although seeming to be nearly perfect, may not always give to our eye an exact representation of what is under its lenses. So, when we talk about the structure of the protoplasm, what the protoplasm is actually composed of, um, scientists don't agree. And so there, there can be no scientific knowledge of the structure of the pl uh, protoplasm. And the author helpfully points out some problems in scientific observation. First, we often take things out of their natural environment into laboratories where we examine and study them. And we don't know that this, this may possibly cause changes in those things um, that mislead us in, in drawing conclusions about those things in nature. Okay, so the fact that we remove things from their natural environment to quote-unquote study them uh, may actually be a cause of problems in our studies. And secondly, the instruments we use are always limited. And so our observations, even though they may be improved by the use of microscopes, are not perfect. Okay, so we don't know what exactly protoplasm is. Next, plant cells and animal cells are of very different shapes and sizes. So even though a cell is the smallest building block of any living thing, the cells themselves, it's not like there's one cell by which all things are constructed. The cells are of very different shapes and sizes. There are some cells, individual cells, that are so large that they can be seen by the eye. For example, the root hairs of plants and eggs of some animals are actually single cells and can be visible. On the other hand, cells may be so minute, so small, that in the case of the plant cells that we call bacteria, several million cells could be placed on the dot of a letter I in a book. The forms of cells may be extremely varied in different tissues. They may assume the form of cubes, columns, spheres, flat plates, or may be so irregular that description is impossible. One kind of tissue cell found in man has a body so small as to be quite invisible to the naked eye, although it has a prolongation several feet in length. Such are some of the cells of the nervous system of man and other large animals, such as the ox, elephant, and whale. All right, so it's almost invisible even though it's very long. It has no width. It's like a line in geometry and is therefore, humanly speaking, invisible. Plant cells and animal cells may live alone or they may form collections of cells known as tissues. Some plants are so simple in structure as to be formed of only one kind of tissue cells. Usually, living organisms are composed of several groups of such tissues. Examples have been given. It is only necessary to call attention to the fact that such collections of tissues may form organisms so tiny as to be barely visible to the eye. As for instance, some water-loving, flowerless plants, or many of the tiny animals living in freshwater or saltwater, such as the hydra, small worms, and tiny crustaceans. On the other hand, among animals, the bulk of the elephant and whale, and among plants, the big trees of California stand out as notable examples. The inorganic, the inorganic matter, matter that has never lived, the inorganic matter covering the earth as air and water, and forming the great mass of its bulk, is made use of by plants and animals. So living plants and animals make use of the inorganic matter covering the earth. The latter animals make their homes in earth, air, or water. They breathe the oxygen of the atmosphere. 
They use the water for drinking. But in the main, their food consists of organic matter. Plants, on the other hand, use the elements contained in the soil, air, and water not only for food, but also to make the living matter of their own bodies. In some mysterious way, of which we shall later learn something, plants take up inorganic and organic substances from the soil and air and transform them into organic matter. So plants can transform dead, not, not just dead matter, but inorganic matter, matter that has never lived. Plants can convert inorganic matter into organic matter. This organic matter then produced by the plants becomes food for animals. In the last chapter, we found that the classes of substances in an animal or plant and the organic food substances have a similar composition. Let us now consider chemically the substance which forms the basis of all living things. Living matter, when analyzed by chemists in a laboratory, seems to have a very complex chemical composition. And we call the study, the chemical study of organic substances, we call organic chemistry. Living matter, when analyzed by chemists in a laboratory, seems to have a very complex chemical composition. It is somewhat like a protein in that it always contains the element nitrogen. It also contains the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, a little sulfur, and perhaps phosphorus. Now we'll study all of these um, chemical elements in chemistry, right, after biology, but in biology we sort of take them for granted and just uh, refer to them since we know we're going to pursue the study of them in chemistry separately. Calcium, iron, silica, sodium, potassium, and other mineral matters are usually found in very minute quantities in its competition, in its composition. We believe that the matter out of which plants and animals are formed, the matter out of which plants and animals are formed, although a very complex building material, and almost impossible of correct analysis, is nevertheless composed of certain chemical elements which are always present. To this living matter, the name protoplasm has been given. Let's just note one thing about that last sentence. Notice that this is supposed to be biology class, and yet the sentence begins, We believe. We believe that the matter out of which plants and animals are formed is composed of certain chemical elements which are always present. Now again, the, the statement we believe is not scientific language, and we need to be careful of these things. This, is, this means that scientists have a theory have a theory that's yet to be tested or proven. It's a, it's a belief. It's a belief. It's a theory. Okay? Pay attention when you read that in a science book. We believe. That doesn't belong in a science textbook. And so we need to make note of it. Protoplasm, then, is made up of certain chemical elements combined in definite proportions. What is of far more importance to us is the fact that it is distinguished by certain properties which it possesses and which inorganic matter does not possess. So what are the properties of protoplasm? Plants and animals are largely made up of living matter. Let's study its properties. First, the living matter of which plants and animals are made up responds to influences or stimulation from without or from outside its own substance. 
both plants and animals are sensitive to touch or stimulation by light, heat, or electricity. Leaves turn toward the source of their light. Some animals are attracted to light and others are repelled by light. The earthworm is an example of an animal who moves away from light. Many other instances might be given. Protoplasm is thus said to be irritable. Irritable. It's sensitive. It responds to influences or stimulation from outside of its own substance. Protoplasm is irritable. That's the first property of protoplasm. Second, protoplasm has the power to move and contract. Protoplasm has the power to move and contract. Muscular movement is a familiar instance of this power. Plants move their leaves and other organs. One-celled animals change their form. Protoplasm has the power to move and contract. Third, protoplasm has the power of taking up food materials, of selecting the materials which can be used by it, and of rejecting substances it cannot use. Protoplasm has the power of taking up food materials that it can use, and refusing or rejecting substances that it cannot use. In tiny parts of the root of a plant called the root hairs, protoplasm takes in only the material which will be of use in forming food or new protoplasm for the plant. An animal selects only such food as it wants and refuses to eat material that it does not use as food. The protoplasm appears to be designed to, to select substances that are used for food by the animal and to reject substances that are not necessary. That's the third uh, property of protoplasm. Fourth, protoplasm grows not as inorganic objects grow, from the outside. And what that means is inorganic objects like rocks, they grow by adding, basically by adding layers to their outside. They get larger by growing from the outside. Protoplasm does not grow in that way as inorganic objects grow, but by a process of taking in food material and then changing it into living material. To do this, it is evident that the same chemical elements must enter into the composition of the food substances as we find in living matter. The simplest plants and animals have this wonderful power as well developed as the most complex forms of life. So the fourth property of protoplasm is that protoplasm grows like living matter, like living material, like living um, living organisms, rather than like stones, inorganic. Fifth, protoplasm, be it in the body of a plant or protoplasm appears to use oxygen. It breathes. Thus, the food substances taken into the body are oxidized. The food substances taken in are oxidized. They either release energy for growth movement, etc., or form new protoplasm. Okay, so protoplasm uses oxygen, and therefore it works through the process called oxidation, which we learned about in lesson two. Next, number six, the sixth property of protoplasm. Protoplasm has the power to rid itself of waste materials, especially those which might be harmful to it. A tree sheds its leaves partly to get rid of the accumulation of mineral matter in the leaves. Plants and animals pass off the carbon dioxide which results from the very processes of living 
the oxidation of food or parts of their own bodies. Animals eliminate wastes containing nitrogen through the skin and kidneys. Protoplasm has the power to rid itself of harmful waste materials. Seventh, protoplasm can reproduce. That is, it can form other matter like itself. New plants are constantly appearing to take the places of those that die. The supply of living things upon the earth is not decreasing. Reproduction is constantly taking place. In a general way, it is possible to say that plants and animals reproduce in a very similar manner. We shall study this in more detail later, so protoplasm can reproduce. To sum up, then, we find that living protoplasm has the properties of sensibility or irritability, motion, growth, and reproduction alike in its simplest state as a one-celled plant or animal and when it enters into the composition of a highly complex organism, such as a tree, a dog, or a man. And this is the end of chapter 3 here. So in chapter 3, we discuss the parts of plants in a simple way. We learn about the fact that, that, part, that plants are made up of parts that have different functions and different forms. Uh, we learned about organs, which are parts of plants that serve a certain function. We learned about tissues, which are sort of the material out of which plants and animals are made. And the tissues differ because they are formed by the collection of different kinds of cells. We then talked about the cell. We talked about the fact that the cell, um, one of the peculiarities of the cell is that it, it contains a nucleus and that this nucleus actually divides uh, to form, uh, to divide and form new cells. That the, that the nucleus contains and is surrounded by a, a, a material, a living material called protoplasm. We then learn seven characteristics of protoplasm or properties of protoplasm. Um, we learned about chlorophyll in plants, um, about the cell wall and membrane. So <clears throat> we learned about organs, tissues, and cells in this chapter helpful beginning to our study of botany. Uh, so I hope that's a helpful introduction and first reading for this chapter. There's lots of material. Remember, in this study in biology, we are not ourselves gaining scientific knowledge. We're studying what biology teaches to prove that we're able to learn the content of the modern natural science of biology. Um, we're able to learn about these things, we're able to know and prove that we know what biology teaches, but we should, <clears throat> we should hesitate to take the next step, which is to actually admit or assume that everything in these lessons is true, because after all, um, for us to have any scientific knowledge, we would have to have knowledge in the, in the sense of modern science. We would have to have knowledge that we have observed in material things. And studying this book, we don't have that knowledge. Remember, in the first chapter, we were actually told that scientific knowledge doesn't come through books. This book is just teaching us the content of what biology teaches, and we want to show that we're able to study and learn and, uh, and be aware of what biology and biologists teach us. Okay? But we're not, we're not agreeing with this information. We're not granting that all of this is true. Uh, we can't because we don't have uh, the scientific knowledge that would enable us to do so. So study this lesson for mastery. Um, complete your lesson assessment and we'll continue our study of biology in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. God bless your studies.